thing that frightens me the most about education is that there's a movement to kick the fun out of our schools. And we as teachers must stand up for the right of our students to have the right to enjoy learning and for teachers to repossess the right to enjoy teaching. And if we can get that message across to our policymakers, I think we can make the right kind of changes in our schools. That as the 1999 Georgia State Teacher of the Year, and then again as the 1999 National Teacher of the Year, representing three and a half million teachers across this country, I have been leading a magical life. In many ways, I am Alex in Wonderland each day falling to a new dimension that surpasses the last in excitement and wonder. But as I enter this fourth and final phase of my National Teacher of the Year tenure, I find myself spending more and more time reflecting about what I have learned during this most wonderful adventure. What I am realizing through this reflection is that the three best descriptors the National Teacher of the Year experience are professional and personal growth, validation, and responsibility. Visiting in hundreds of classrooms, serving on numerous state and national committees, panels, and boards, taking part in countless seminars and conferences, and engaging in conversations with educators and other stakeholders from all levels has provided the most complete and valuable single professional development experience that this teacher can imagine. Meanwhile, traveling, being involved in new and previously unfamiliar activities of various types, meeting and getting to know individuals from all walks of life, and being exposed to new vistas of many different types have combined to provide a personal journey that has been both exciting and strengthening. My beliefs about teachers have been confirmed, and my pride in this profession has been magnified. I have witnessed the proof on a daily basis that our teaching force includes some of the most energetic, enthusiastic, and ingenious professionals that can be found anywhere in the world doing any job. Even in situations that are sometimes much less than instructionally favorable, aesthetically pleasing, or professionally equitable, I have seen teaching stars creating phenomenal learning environments and causing remarkable successes to happen for their students. These master educators demonstrate a collective capability, a strength under pressure, and a persistent desire to learn more and improve their performance in the classroom that makes me extremely proud to be their representative. Why kindergarten? Um, when I was growing up, I never related to my peers as well as I did to younger kids. I liked drama and music and literature and art, and so somehow I identified better with kids who were not on my age level. And um, I didn't want to go into teaching. I wanted to be a Broadway star, and my parents told me that um, there were too many people out there that wanted to be Broadway stars. I'd never make a living at it, never make any money, so why didn't I go into teaching? Um, and so I did, and uh, I went in as a speech and language therapist, and the kindergarten teachers and the kindergarten kids seemed to really be enjoying learning. Um, there was such a sense of discovery and adventure and excitement in kindergarten classrooms. They weren't tainted, they hadn't learned to dislike school or hate teachers, and they were like sponges that would soak up whatever you threw out to them. And uh, so I said, hey, that's what I want to do. That looks good. And I went back and got my master's. And um, I've taught pre-kindergarten, kindergarten, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, and been an early childhood consultant. And now two years of on the road. Um, at not a Broadway star, but pretty close. Young Country 90.7 FM, we're back with the 1999 National Teacher of the Year, Andy Baumgartner. So what made you choose kindergarten over a middle school or a high school? Well, I have an attention span that's about five minutes long. And <laughs> Where else would I fit? Well, um, I've always enjoyed young kids, uh, and there is a real joy to watching children absorb something new. 
um, and in kindergarten they haven't yet had a chance to be tainted or to believe that school's not cool um, and so they're really into it and excited about being at school and every day's an adventure. So you don't have... The thing that um, has made me a teacher, though, has been experiencing life at school through the eyes of my son. Um, Brock is 22. He is a beautiful, fair-haired, golden young man who has a learning disability and attention deficit, and he's hyperkinetic. Uh, he came home from the first day of kindergarten and said, I hate this, I'm not going back and you can't make me, and he was serious. When it really hit bottom was when he was able to, through the assistance of the uh, LD teacher, move his numbers closer together and therefore was cured and thrown back into the normal population. And after that, it was downhill all the way. Um, we have to understand that children learn in so many different ways and we have to give them the opportunities to use their strengths in learning. This was a little boy that um, I could have tried to beat multiplication tables into him and I still wouldn't have gotten anywhere. But I took him to see the Phantom of the Opera and he walked out of the theater having never seen and never heard any of it and proceeded to sing the score from the time the curtain went up until the curtain went down. Yet his teachers said he was unmotivated, he was lazy, or he was dumb. Um, not true and not so. I had to have really look carefully at, at what was going on in school. Um, and we fought until he finally dropped out of high school without a diploma. Um, and. On top of that, we did tough love and the whole bit. Um, in a teacher's home, when the child's not doing well in the school setting, it's hell. And um, so it, it taxes every aspect of your family life. And um, I could not reach him, and I didn't understand that because I was reaching everybody else's kid. Why couldn't I reach my own? Um, and I pushed him and pushed him and pushed him, and I had to learn that pushing is not what it takes to be a teacher, guiding and nurturing and strengthening and comforting and giving what a child needs to feel good about themselves is what teaching is all about. That doesn't mean that we don't set standards, and it doesn't mean that the standards can't be high, and it doesn't mean that we don't accept less than they're capable of, but we get them there by encouraging them and coaching them and working with them, not by simply stomping our feet and telling them to jump through the hoop. That doesn't work. But um, Brock taught me what it feels like on the other side. And he taught me that um, what seems obvious to me is not necessarily going to seem obvious to my students. And therefore, I've got to get inside of their heads and get inside their bodies and look out through their eyes to figure out what it's going to take. The other important thing that I learned from that lesson was that you don't teach children in isolation. You teach families. And when you have a child who's struggling in school, you have a family that is struggling at home. And there are several heroes in my life who are teachers who did nothing more than to say to me, you know, Andy, he's got a lot up there if we could just figure out how to get to it. Or teachers who said to me, he's a nice kid. He really likes people or teachers who said to me, well, you know, he's not going to burn the world up academically, and he's not going to pressure himself to, to reach this goal or that goal, but he's not going to have a heart attack from overstress either. <laughs> but for whatever reason, we could not seem to reach him in school. Who had a really tough time, but who has uh, come back into my life. Um, and is wanting to be a part of my life and has gotten his GED and enrolled in technical school and is going to be okay and he's going to make it. And that has made me realize how important it is to know each of the kids in my class, to try and give each what they need, to try to make school fun 
and lively and pleasurable and enjoyable so that they will want to learn and want to be in school and, and want to work. So he's taught me that we don't understand or we don't value the importance of getting from here to here by going this way. And sometimes that's the way we need to go to find the things we're missing. And one place that we went was an alternative school. And this was a last chance schools for kids before being incarcerated. This was their last step or they were going to jail. Um, we had been to all of these schools that were highly innovative and, and colorful and all the excitement happening everywhere, just like I love. And we sat down in this classroom where it was very quiet and the kids were, were engaged in what they were doing and they were reading. There was not a lot of excitement going on and one of the judges leaned over to me and said, how do we grade this as teacher of the year? You know, this, this doesn't look like anything that wonderful is happening. And I said, well, you know, um, all these kids would be in jail if they weren't here, and not a single one of them is up out of their chair. They're not trying to strangle anybody. They're not ripping anything off the walls. They're not being arrogant or rude. They're engaged in learning. I'd say the sky's real good material for a teacher of the year. Um, and so in, his, in our interview with him, um, he talked about each of the kids individually with a, with a great deal of love and, and compassion, the kind of teacher you, you want your child to have. And um, one of the other judges who had been the Georgia Teacher of the Year before me was also a Miss Georgia. And she's a very beautiful lady and um, is a musician. And this little girl in the class, 16, 17, I, not little girl, but young lady, had had come over to her while we were in there and told her she was the prettiest lady she'd ever seen. And they had gotten into a conversation about music and she had told her that she played the piano. And so she mentioned that to the teacher and the teacher said, um, oh, we're really proud of her. And so we, we said, well, could we hear her play the piano? And he said, sure. So they brought her in and she sat down at a piano and proceeded to play the most beautiful concerto I'd ever heard. And then, and then just bridged without, without even a pause from that into I don't remember what it was but it was the it was the song that was on the radio at that time with her own frills and flourishes and flares and she finished and we were all astounded and the Miss Georgia Jamie said to her who do you study with and she said and she said what I listened to the radio um, had never had a lesson whatsoever. Now this was a bright child with incredible talent who was finding herself at the alternative school. Why is that? And, and this is one of the concerns that we as early childhood people are trying to get across to people that yes we want to teach reading and yes we want to teach math and yes we want to teach writing but we need ample time for teaching socialization skills right. and teaching children to be together and to work together harmoniously and to appreciate and understand and accept each other. And those are valid, time-consuming academic pursuits right. in the kindergarten as well. And with the push right now of everything being on testing and standards as we talked about earlier a lot of that is being cast by the wayside as not important and then you talked about your interest in theater and Absolutely. it is my honest opinion that music and art and drama and movement and dance are the things that lift our spirits to want a better world and so as I see people wanting to eliminate those things from the curriculum or calling those um, extra frill, I see a very dangerous attitude there. And, and I think it is those things that help us shape the consciousness to be able to deal with problems as serious as violence and the other things that are affecting our schools in negative ways. Well, when I came through school, we were taken to the symphony, we were taken to the ballet, we had operas visit our school, we were engaged in plays, we did, we learned how to do public speaking. These were not considered extras. And we hear everybody bemoaning the fact that our education systems are not what they used to be, and yet they want to cut out the very things that made our schools 
what they were. Um, these are the things that make our children's spirits soar and make them seek better things. Hello and welcome back. Chris and I are here talking to the 1999 National Teacher of the Year, Andy Baumgartner. Do you believe that schools are doing all they can to keep kids safe or what else do you think needs to be done? I think that um, violence is not a school problem, it's a community problem. And I think our schools are small communities that reflect what's happening in the larger community outside. We have to do everything that we can to make our schools safe for our children. I think what we need to be doing is educating children about violence and, and protecting themselves, educating teachers about how violence happens. But mostly we need to be looking at why we are not meeting the needs of these children who wig out <laughs> and figure a way to um, address those kinds of concerns and, and make sure that we're doing the best job that we can to meet the needs. I, having a child who failed in school, I know what rage and anger that can, that can put in a person and we need to look at helping helping students understand how to control anger and rage. But mostly we need to be looking at our entire society and what message we're sending to kids about violence. Right. And we need to work together on sending a better message. Henry County Youth Center. Um, now, having picked up my son from jail and been through the tough love thing and all of that, I was r really not looking forward to this one. And I figured these were going to be very disrespectful, very gruff children that were going to sit there and be so cool I couldn't possibly do anything with them. These were bright, attentive, respectful young men and women who sat and we discussed making mistakes in your lives and how to learn from those mistakes and move on. They were open with me, they were honest with me, they let me sit with them at their table at lunch. We had a great time, nice kids who got misdirected somewhere but who are getting a second chance and who have a real hope at this place because it's not a dismal jail-like atmosphere. It's a learning atmosphere. It's a real school. We've got to understand that sometimes the most important thing we do for a child is to help the family understand and accept that child for who he is. My heart, as you said, is with special needs kids because until you've lived and looked through the eyes of a child who fails through school continually, no matter what he does, um, it's a very heartbreaking thing to watch, and especially when it's your child. Uh, Jason has taught me, by benefit of being in special ed programs that cared for him and nurtured him and, and met all of his needs. He was in public school from the time he was 18 months until he was 22 years old. He was treated with absolute love and patience and kindness. They attended to his every need. He was the first of our sons to graduate from high school. He's a doll. How many wonderful, wonderful teachers there are out there ready to do whatever students and kids need when we understand what those needs are. The ICANN special ed program in Southside High School in Muncie, where a special ed teacher has developed an industry for her special students in this school where they make and sell their own goods and these children walked into the room with I can written all the way across their faces, held their heads up high, held their shoulders high, and were willing to talk to anybody about anything and everything. And they had speech defects, and they were in wheelchairs, and one had spina bifida, and walked like this, and her, her legs were terribly misshapen. But they, they had a sense of who they were, and when you walked into the room, you felt like if they can, I can. I went from there to the Soldier and Sailors Children's Home in Knightstown, where I saw just an amazing residential learning center um, with teachers who were giving it their all 
um, and loving being there and loving those kids. And I saw where the ideas of education for special needs children had really been put into effect correctly in very small classrooms, um, lots of direct teacher-pupil interaction. They had art and music for these kids. They had ROTC for them. They had all the special activities. And it was, it was a wonderful situation. I think that um, when mainstreaming and inclusion are in the best interest of the child, and they're provided the support that they need in that classroom to get the education they need, that they can be wonderful things. I think when they're used as cost-effective methods to save money and everybody's dumped into one classroom and the teachers said, now teach them all, that's a criminal action. And I think in too many places that's the way it's being used. And Andy, who is 17 and a high school senior and um, an A-plus student, except for calculus, and I forgive him that. Um, he's the president of his senior class, and he's a resident star of his drama club. He's going off to, to work for Disney this summer in Florida, and he's, he will start college in the fall. Um, has had a terrific experience and been uh, nurtured and been taught to meet his potential and to go above and beyond, and, and I, I want that for, for all children. I want that for the Brocks as well as for the Andes. But he is no brighter and no more special than either of the other two. His brightness just happened to be in a direction that teachers know how to focus on and work with. What I want is a school system that will accept Brock as a challenge and say, we can turn this kid around. We can make this kid feel good about himself and we can make him successful in school. And that's why I'm very fearful of the standards movement and the way it's being used right now. And it's why I'm very fearful of the idea that we can measure and describe people by a score on a test. So I have three very different boys, but three very wonderful boys. That's very cool. So are they kind of your inspiration to Absolutely. keep on doing this? Absolutely. Hello, my name is Joe. I work in a button factory. I have a wife, a dog, and a whole family. I can turn a button with my right hand. Hello, my name is Joe. I work in a button factory. I have a wife, a dog, and a whole family. I can turn a button with my left hand. Hello, my name is Joe. I work in a button factory. I have a wife, a dog, and a whole family. I can turn a button with my right foot. Hello, my name is Joe. I work in a button factory. I have a wife, a dog, and a whole family. I can turn a button with my left foot. Hello, my name is Joe. I work in a button factory. I have a wife, a dog, and a whole family. I can turn a button with my head. Hello, my name is Joe. I work in a button factory. I have a wife, a dog, and a whole family. I can turn a button with my whole body. A four-year-old taught me that, that lives in my neighborhood, and I've used it ever since. And, and that is an important thing that I want all of you who are studying to be teachers to understand. Throughout your career, you should be adding to your bag of tricks. Every teacher should have a bag of tricks. You should have favorite stories that you tell well. You should have favorite songs that you sing. You should have favorite games that you know how to make happen anywhere with little or no materials to accompany them. You should have a whole slew of favorite books that you have practiced and practiced and practiced in reading with multitudes of different voices and emotion. You should have favorite poems. You should have anything that elicits excitement for children. And you should have it ready to pull out on a moment's notice. And each year we do, we do little productions for the school and for the, the community. One year we had a wedding for Sleeping Beauty and we married Aww. off Sleeping Beauty and Prince Charming. That's very cute. One year we knighted Jack after he killed the giant. <laughs> so, I, you know, I like when kids are involved, I like when they're learning something, I like when they're feeling good about being in school. And I would say that 
we have very much forgotten the importance of the sparkle in education. Um, why should we expect children to come to school and learn through skill and drill and boring when there are so many influences outside of that that are grabbing their attention from every angle. We've got to stop fearing those things and learn to employ them in our instruction. The thing I find that is hardest for teachers right now is they are so stressed with meeting this deadline or hitting this standard or be sure we get to page 96 because it's going to be on the test that we forget that learning happens from the smallest of activities. And so when you pull out anything that adds a twinkle to an eye or adds levity to class or brings pleasure into that group of children, you have accomplished the most important ingredient in learning. And that is you have gotten children's attention and you have turned them on to the idea of learning. And without that, you can hang the rest of it up. It's not going to happen. Okay, seeing as how you're one of the kids' very first teachers, you're the, you're the first one that gets to break them into school. What do you think is one of the most vital things that you have to instill in them? I think we have to, as teachers, understand that um, kids come to school with some concerns and some worries. We have to put those to rest. Mm -hmm. We have to make sure that they feel safe in school. Um, and we have to make them feel loved and cared about. Um, and, and we have to make school an inviting place that says, come be here, learn with me, enjoy this, have a good time. That's what school's all about. Um, and I think if we can teach that appreciation very young and very early, then that's something you keep with you as you go through school. All right. So we've got to stop being afraid to make our classrooms lively and happy and colorful and pleasurable, enjoyable places for people to be. And I think that goes for seniors in high school just as much as it goes for kindergarten students. The most common question I'm asked is, are you going back to the classroom? And my answer is you can never go back to a classroom. A classroom is the most wonderful and important place that a person can be, so anytime you move into a classroom, you are moving forward and moving ahead. As to far as what I want to do, in August of 2000, I will be teaching five-year-olds at the school that I left two years ago, and I am so looking forward to it. Um, I want to be back in a place where when people act like five-year-olds, it makes sense because they're five years old. <laughs> I couldn't imagine looking into a five-year-old's eyes and saying, you know, I'm not going to teach anymore. So I think you made the right decision there. <laughs> so what are some key points you would tell a teacher trying to move into being a kindergarten teacher? Um, are we talking about just new teachers in general? Yeah, or? obviously it's going to take patience, but what, uh, what else would a it? A lot of patience. <laughs> Which yeah. I have none. <laughs> but I think it takes a lot of courage to be a teacher. I think you have to be... Um, a strong advocate for children. I think you have to be a strong advocate for what's right. I think you are trained to teach with beliefs and a philosophy and then you go into schools where people want to disrupt that philosophy or take it away from you and have you teach in a certain way. You have to be a strong person who says this is what I believe and, and this is why I teach this way. You have to have a good sense of humor. Um, <laughs> Imagine. You really yeah. do. Um, you have to have a life outside of school. You have to have some hobbies that you enjoy thoroughly and a strong sense of family because you need that support system when you leave school. And most of all, I try to tell young teachers that this is one job that can become an absolute obsession. <laughs> that in teaching, the more you do, the more you find that can be done. Right. And you can get yourself so totally involved that you forget to live outside of being a teacher. And that's not fair to our children. They need well-rounded, happy people. And so that means taking time away from teaching to play and have a good time and get plenty of rest so that you come back energized and ready to do it the next time. I think that we are quite often, as teachers, our own worst enemies. I think that we tend to carry around the image that we are just teachers. 
and we're not just teachers. We are very important individuals who serve a most important service to our community and work in an extremely fine profession. Some real concerns I have for the direction our educational system is heading um, and trying to help them understand the mistakes that I feel that we're making in trying to judge schools in the same way that we judge football teams and that is the one with the highest number wins and that's not what teaching and education and students are all about and we're forgetting the most basic principle that we teach individuals and that unless we cultivate those individuals we've missed the boat and we've not, not done anybody a favor. I saw incredible educators and it again it, it, it has really um, strengthened my belief and my pride in our profession. I do honestly believe that the strength of the United States is centered around the strength of its public school system throughout all of these years and if we don't awaken to that realization and if we don't continue to strengthen it we will continue to decline as a nation and I sure hate to see that happen. Because teaching has become a job with too little affirmation and validation attached to it, we must all learn to give that to each other. My position as National Teacher of the Year has taught me that believing in your work and then having that belief confirmed by others can strengthen a person's resolve to do more and to be more successful. The most important thing that any of us in this room or in any classroom or in any school anywhere in this country can do for our profession, for our schools, and for our students is to encourage the acceptance of the idea that we are all teachers, yet none of us are just teachers. Instead, we must hold our heads up high and announce for all of the world to hear that of all of the important job choices we could have chosen, we chose the most important one of all. The only one that I know of that attempts to elevate an entire society by lifting up its students one child at a time. Good luck, good teaching, and thank you very, very much. The Teacher of the Year program is so amazing. And when I was with the, the State Teachers of the Year, it was one time in my career where I felt everybody around me was just as impassioned and just as, as excited about the whole thing and, and just as optimistic as I was and, and still held on to their ideals of youth and still believed that there could be a better world and we could help propel the world in that direction. Andy, we appreciate everything you've done and you know we love you and thanks for all that you've done for us and for our kids, for the role model you've been and are. And thanks so much for all the energy that you show and that you've shared.